this particular thing, they had, you know, they had done what I'm going to do, and I don't know what it was, but it was, it was up, he's saying it's, it's playing out of the sort of American I mean, state. I'm sure Hello, welcome. I'm so glad to see so many of you here tonight on this terribly rainy, dreary evening. Um, we are nonetheless very uh, bright and cheery inside and looking forward to tonight's event. Um, my name is Kendra Sullivan, uh, and on behalf of the Center for Humanities at the CUNY Graduate Center, I'd like to thank you for joining us here. Uh, the Center for the Humanities encourages collaborative and creative work in the humanities and the humanities-related social sciences at CUNY and across the city uh, through a whole host of programs, um, seminars, conferences, publications, and exhibitions. Uh, we are particularly thrilled and honored uh, to host Melinda Cooper and Lee Claire LaBerge for tonight's workshop on the moral economies of neoliberalism. This event is part of a series of three we have organized with Michael Newton and Zone Books. Uh, and we really thank them um, for being conscientious, uh, committed um, collaborators throughout. Um, finally, I'd like to thank the Political Science Program, as well as the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, there are a couple of excellent events uh, that I'd like to call your attention to coming up, including Center for Place, Culture, and Politics, Consciousness, and Revolution II. Educating for Change in the Age of Authoritarian Populism. And that's on May 5th and 6th. And you'll find flyers for that uh, at the door, um, at, the, at the table by the door. Um, it brings together radical students and educators from all over the world to share knowledge, resources, history, and practices related to the role of pedagogy for developing consciousness in uh, the present moment, as well as um, our third zone collaboration about neoliberalism and the rise of finance with Ivan Asher, Melinda Cooper, and Robin Morasco on May 3rd. Um, I think it's here in the skylight as well. Um, tonight, our speakers will present for approximately half an hour, maybe a little more, and then we'll open up the floor for broader conversation. Um, I will briefly introduce our speakers, uh, but Lee Claire LaBerge herself will do a much more thorough job of introducing Melinda Cooper. Uh, Lee Claire LaBerge, um, her first book, Scandals and Abstraction, Financial Fiction of the Long 1980s, out from Oxford in 2015, tracked the contest between postmodern and realist fictions about finance in a nascent era of financialization, and her articles have appeared in Radical Philosophy, Studies in American Fiction, Criticism, Journal of Con Cultural Economy, and, the Ra and Radical History Review. She is the co-editor, along with Allison Schunkweiler, of Reading Capitalist Realism, uh, Iowa 2014. She is professor of English at the City University of New York's BMCC campus and a faculty fellow at the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. Um, again, very briefly, Melinda Cooper is associate professor in the School of Social and Political Science at the University of Sydney, Australia. She is the author of Family Values Between Neoliberalism, and the new, new Social Conservatism, and Life as Surplus, Biotechnology and Capitalism in the Neoliberal Era. We're thrilled to have you both here. Um, thanks so much for coming from all, all over and very near. Um, please join me, oh, skipping back to Lee Claire LaBerge. Her new book, Wages Against Artwork, The Social Practice of Decommodification, is under contract with Duke University Press, and she's just found out, which is why it's written in at the end, and I overlooked reading about it in the first place. So congratulations, and um, without further ado, um, join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you. Um, hi, wow, what an honor to welcome uh, Melinda Cooper to New York and to CUNY. Uh, 
Um, and I'll just thank people um, who Kendra has already thanked because um, it takes a lot to put together an event like this. Um, but thanks to the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics and to Mary Taylor in particular, uh, to the Humanities Center and to Samson Starkweather in particular, and to Zone Books, particularly um, Michael Newton. And of course, thanks to Melinda uh, to coming to us, for coming to us from Sydney, Australia, to be here with us tonight. Um, so Melinda is Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Sydney. She's the author of Life as Surplus, Biotechnology and Capitalism in a Neoliberal Era, uh, which came out in 2008 from uh, Washington. And she's the co-author of Clinical Labor, Tissue Donors and Research Subjects in the Global Economy, which came out in 2014 from Duke. She's currently an editor at the Journal of Cultural Economy, and she is the co-editor of a new series at Stanford University Press um, entitled Currencies, New Thinking for Financial Times. So while we have a future of Melinda's editorship to look forward to, uh, tonight we're here to consider um, her authorship in a stunning new book, Family Values Between Neoliberalism and the New Social Conservatism, which is just out from Zone Books. This book will change our conversation. It will enrich our terms of analysis for thinking about political economy, and it will open up for further investigation specific sociocultural configurations, economic possibilities, and indeed narrative forms that haunt and organize what Melinda calls the neoliberal neoconservative state or the state that took shape in response to the decomposition of the Fordist wage and the agitation of minoritarian social movements in the 1960s and 1970s. In our own popular political vernacular, Melinda's book is an exploration of the question, how do moral conservatism and economic liberalism, by which we mean economic conservatism, work together to form governing alliances in the United States? How do they work together to form a political epistemology in which Christian evangelicals can vote for Donald Trump? Citizens can make the demand to get government out of Medicare. And New York Times liberal columnist Nicholas Kristof, in an article trumpeting the so-called social entrepreneurship of the website Kiva, can claim in all seriousness, quote, you too can be a micro lender to the poor, end quote. This genre of contradictions have, at least since the early 2000s, and now with increasing and interdisciplinary regularity, been grouped under the rubric of neoliberalism, a term which has become probably our most capacious, if not yet most contested, site for economically oriented social and cultural analysis. And I think before we can fully appreciate the intervention Melinda makes in her book, we need to appreciate our already received genealogies of neoliberalism. So neoliberalism is a period from the 1970s through the present. As a period, it has been marked by the relative importance of services and both a deregulated and re-regulated financial sector in the global north and the shift to manufacturing and market-friendly structural adjustment policies in the global south. Neoliberalism is an attendant doctrine of governance that sees economic inequality and risk as ineradicable and mandates competitiveness, leanness, and flexibility over redistribution, solidarity, and social justice for states, businesses, and individuals. In the writing of political scientist Wendy Brown, following the work of Michel Foucault and Jamie Beck, another language for the investigation of neoliberalism has emerged. It is a broader, quote, order of normative reason, in Brown's language, that has amplified features of capitalism, including contract, investment, self-maximization, and entrepreneurship, to the point that it may have become something qualitatively new. And finally, of course, neoliberalism is a movement of intellectuals associated with the Mont Pelerin Society, founded by the British-Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek in 1947, that outlined and propagated a doctrine through think tanks, business leaders, academic institutions, and policymakers. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, neoliberalism took root institutionally in the United States at places such as the University of Chicago and George Mason University in Virginia, and Melinda will pay special attention to these, the American neoliberals, 
Despite the often asserted novelty of the category, neoliberalism circulated in academic discourse as early as the 1960s to describe both a particular form of conservative capitalism in the rebuilding of West Germany and authoritarian strains of anti-socialism in Latin America. Far from the breadth of meaning that the term invites today, a 1966 article stated simply that, quote, contrary to 19th century laissez-faire liberalism, neoliberalism assigns positive duties to the state, end quote. One seldom encounters such concise summaries today as the term sutures together left inflected invest investigations of all aspects of culture. For the past 10 years, the most important books for scholars working interdisciplinarily on what we might call cultures of neoliberalism have been uh, David Harvey's, who's in the audience with us, uh, David Harvey's A Brief History of Neoliberalism, and Michel Foucault's The Birth of Politics Lectures at the Collège de France. Put broadly, Harvey is used to periodize, and Foucault is used to conceptualize. Harvey offers a timeline dating from the crises of the 1970s that links the four picture, figures pictured on his book's stark black cover, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, Augusto Pinochet, and Deng Xiaoping. In a mode of rule that combined market incentives through privatization and loosened consumer credit with nationalism through warmongering and the repression of alternative political formations. For Harvey, neoliberalism was a game plan for, quote, the restoration or reconstruction of, reconstruction of naked class power locally as well as transnationally. Okay, sorry, thanks. Uh, rolling back post-war policies of capital controls, nationalization, and the welfare state. For Foucault, the generative riddle was why neoliberalism possessed the governmental rationality that he claimed socialism lacked. Foucault himself turned to the neoliberals precisely to undergird theoretically and to elaborate historically a new practice of anti-normative freedom that eschewed a subjective basis, that refused historical elongation, that recognized its own need for careful maintenance not reducible to forms of institutional power. Far from seeking to replace the master category of capitalism with a new master category of neoliberalism, Foucault explored neoliberalism in the 1970s to undermine what he saw as the Marxist contention that, quote, there can only be one capitalism since there is only one logic of capital, end quote. By fracturing or multiplying the varieties of capitalism, Foucault opened up what he called, quote, a field of possibilities still open for capitalism, end quote. An ambiguous phrase and one that seems prescient to the many Foucault-derived studies that center on the so-called entrepreneur of the self. So I think many of us know the neoliberals and neoliberalism from Foucault, and in many ways, Melinda's book can be seen as an incisive response to the ahistoricism and ethical overtures of Foucault's lectures. And we'll see this in Melinda's own talk. But before we get there, I do want to offer one qualification of Foucault's work. Quite simply, we know what Foucault thought of the neoliberals. But what did the neoliberals think of Foucault? The answer is revealing. At a symposium at the University of Chicago in 2012, leading neoliberal economist Gary Becker, one of the central players in Melinda's story, was asked to review Foucault's lectures on biopolitics, which he claimed he had never read before. His response, quote, there's not much I disagree with, end quote. So indeed, Foucault did attend quite closely to American neoliberalism and German ordoliberalism. And both Foucault and the economic historian Philip Morawski in his 2013 Never Let a Serious Crisis Go to Waste venture into the logic, language, assumptions, and causalities of neoliberal epistemology. Indeed, one wonders if they attend to these texts too closely. They attempt to excavate the prose and organize the structure of the arguments to find the coherency and contradiction in neoliberal texts. But here's the problem. Neoliberal economic philosophy follows in the long microeconomic tradition of tautology and casuistry. To go ever deeper is to risk not an unveiling, but rather a mirroring. And it's this refusal of hermeneutics on the one hand and a refusal of moralizing on the other hand that, what, that is what makes Melinda's book so unique. <clears throat> 
This book may be, in fact, the first cultural history of neoliberalism as a critique. Instead of seeking out ever deeper levels of contradiction within the argument, Melinda resituates the neoliberals as they're forced to respond to the demands of, 1970s, of the 1970s. Feminism, black power, the rise of the gay rights movement, but also the beginnings of the AIDS crisis, and of course the dramatic changes in global and economic structure that were ushered in by the Federal Reserve and the Carter administration in the late 1970s. Throughout the book, Melinda too answers the facile question that the American liberal, liberals have long asked themselves, what is the matter with Kansas? But Kansas, of course, is not a term of analysis. Rather, inflation, monetarism, and asset-backed welfare are. No academic discipline holds a monopoly of tautology like economics, what Murawski calls, quote, a neoliberal budget of paradoxes. And nowhere is this as clear in neoliberal theories of pricing. Price reflects all available knowledge, and to quote Hayek himself, quote, knowledge is the chief good that can be had at a price, end quote. How should we read this type of claim? As descriptive, as pros proscriptive, as refusing or heralding in new forms of social normativity? Through a series of remarkable case studies, Melinda shows just how nimble, adaptive, organizing, but also how deeply reactionary the neoliberals ultimately came to be. Her most forceful argument, found on almost every page of this book, is that perhaps the most promiscuously used phrase of neoliberal ideology, that man is an entrepreneur of himself, is not only deeply inadequate for, but in fact an impediment to an understanding of neoliberal forms of social organization. As her title, Family Values, alerts us to, behind every successful entrepreneur of himself is a wife. This ongoing dialectic between the familial, private, and public as a site for both social intervention and social demarcation is what capacitates neoliberal critique. And I'm reminded here of an image that circulated a few years ago on uh, social media during one of the many Tea Party protests. Um, and the subject of the protest was to get the state out of of, of something. Um, I don't remember what this particular protest was trying to get the state out of. But in the image, we see a small band of protesters standing on a street corner, limbed by sidewalks on both sides, with stoplights hanging sturdily above them, and the police protecting them. And someone had doctored the photo to point out the stoplights, the police presence, the drainage system, the sidewalk, all state forms. And indeed one wonders, get the state out of municipal infrastructure? Get the state out of the police? Are we on our way back to some kind of neo-feudalism in addition to the neoliberalism and the new social conservatism that Melinda brings our attention to? Well, kind of, she suggests. And this is not the proto-queer feudalism of Silvia Federici. Rather, this is the poor law tradition in which one's title can be inherited, but so can one's debts. The family comes to assume economic responsibility for the subject, and the state comes to assume moral responsibility for the family. What Melinda finds is that neoliberalism intercalcates reactionary forms of all ages and enjoins them to certain sites of liberal social progress. Central to most neoliberal logics, from questions of how should one behave in a bathhouse to questions of how should the Federal Reserve manage money supply, Melinda discovers the trope of the heteronormative family. The welfare state will not be expanded. It is over. Rather, the family will be rearticulated and reconstituted, and those who are willing to join this normative formation will be supported for the good of a market-based society. Thus, the neoliberals will support gay marriage, but only on the condition that gay marriage becomes straight marriage. And indeed, uh, just a few weeks ago, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals ruled for the first time in U.S. history that um, gay men and lesbians are protected by the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and it was neoliberal judge Richard Posner who wrote the most cited decision of this. Case, um, But regardless of who has married, marriages will not have an easy out. Neoliberals also oppose no-fault divorce. 
Queers can't agitate for things as queers, but they might assume forms of white heterosexual masculinity and then be entitled to these things. Women can't advocate for it as women, but they can advocate for it as members of a male-headed family unit. The state will support the welfare family, but only on the condition that women maintain, or in some senses, in cases, initiate a paternalist relationship to the child's father. This normative family organization will also come with financial support, but it will be in the form of asset-backed welfare. With proper government encouragement, perhaps then we all really can become entrepreneurs of ourselves. And there's a real moment that Melinda draws our attention to when a, a constituent of Republicans and Democrats were ready at the end of the 1960s to perhaps expand uh, the social wage to let women, single mothers, gay and lesbian households, African Americans, all sort of start to participate if in differing ways in the, in the benefits of the Fordist um, family wage. And this is the crucial and dramatic setting of Melinda's book. Um, hers is, I think, she can correct me, um, a quite generous reading of the social possibilities of Fordism. But then, as we all know, the Keynesian curtain draws to a close. Henceforth, both the left and right will have to respond to what that organization made possible, what should be conserved from it, and what must be abandoned. Progressive social change will be halted, but so will be rising wages. And this tension between state management of sexual and gender normativity and state management of asset prices and money supply becomes a site of fertile ideological crossover. And Melinda provides two wonderful examples here. Indeed, while Foucault was likely in the bathhouses, a time during which he was beginning his own theorizing on the potential anti-normative possibility of neoliberal discourse, the neoliberals themselves were theorizing about how neoliberal precepts might intercede into the developing AIDS crisis. Judge Richard Posner, who I just mentioned, wrote, quote, people do not leave off acting rationally when they leave the marketplace and go home, or for that matter, to a singles bar, a homosexual bathhouse, or a heroin shooting gallery, end quote. Rather, the bathhouses themselves could be subject to the logic of neoliberal theories of pricing. So if one chooses to engage in bathhouse sex, then one must have concluded that the risk of HIV transmission was the price to be paid for the sexual encounter. But if the neoliberals were willing to let homosexual sex be somewhat freed from moral regulation through their optic of pricing, then other prices, namely the price of money, became a moral problem. As the effects of the post-gold standard inflation of the U.S. dollar began to be felt through out the American stock and bond holding classes by the late 1970s, both neoliberals and new conservatives began to reconceive of inflation as an attack on the American family unit. It's worth noting, as Melinda does, that inflation throughout the 70s had the effect of liberal wealth redistribution. While the majority of Americans would and then did benefit from inflation, its transposition into a moral panic in which, to quote conservative writer George Gilder, quote, wealth holders would be forced to watch their grandsons grow their hair down to their shoulders, drop out of expensive schools financed by disappearing family wealth, and dabble in careers in art and carpentry interspersed with unemployment checks. This period, too, would also draw to a close. As narratives about social leniency of inflation began to circulate, the federal government was able to consistently promote asset growth over wage growth. But this too will ultimately redound to the normative family in the form of inheritance. What Milton Freeman will call not really an economic issue, but rather, quote, an accident of birth, end quote. Um, so I want to I wanna close my, my remarks with some provisional comments and questions for Melinda. And you can choose to take them or leave them uh, as you see fit. Um, so this is such an exhaustive history, social history of, of uh, US uh, social and monetary and fiscal policy um, through the 60s and the 70s and, and the 80s. Um, but I see two, two sort of missing pieces of the story maybe. One is um, immigration to the United States, both the, the changes that came from the 1965 
um, Immigration Act, um, and then, of course, increasing um, undocumented Im immigration um, by 1994 uh, with the passage of NAFTA. Particularly in terms of social labor composition and the rise of the service economy, it seems like the race and gender and um, ethnic questions that, that arise with changing immigration could be a, a quite important part of your story. Secondly, you at points call asset-based welfare a kind of punitive welfare. Um, but of course, the other form of punitive expansion during the period in which your, your book is concerned with is the rise of the prison industry and the prison industrial complex. And it's the same people who were routinely left out of the Fordist wage, both when and after it was operative, who are the ones who will begin to populate prisons. Um, and so I was wondering if you wanted to um, remark on either of those. And then finally, a sort of larger um, theoretical uh, remark about uh, this book's sort of rich intervention into some of the structuring questions of a Marxist political economy. Um, I think this book provides an exploration as to what forms of sociality are possible within a given economic form. And here, of course, it's the what was possible within the Fordist wage and what's possible to hold on to or to let go of and to critique after the Fordist wage. Um, and you really present the, the loss of the Fordist wage as a, as a moment of genuine contest between the left, between the neoliberals, and then between the new conservatives. Um, and I think it's to your credit that in the book you largely abjure the language of, of terms like rate of profit, regime of accumulation, uh, commodity-based expansion, asset-based um, expansion. I'm thinking of some of Giovanni Arigi's work on uh, commodity formations versus uh, finance formations in, in time and space. Um, but it does seem to me that this book is staging a kind of argument about what kind of social formations and contests are possible within the wage and within the asset? And what kind of social forms and social contests are possible um, between the twin cycles of sort of debt and, and credit um, that you outline? So one question I have is, is this book a sort of argument for commodification over financialization? Is it fair to read it like that? And then I think I want to just, I would ask if, if I could push you a little bit further into making the argument, even at a more speculative level, what did cause the inflation of the early 1970s and how is that related to the social movements of the late Fordist era? What is the relationship between inflation and social movements and what should the left's position be in understanding this relationship um, in in the era that you study, but also in our current era, right? I was just wondering if you could maybe, um, you know, this book obviously was written before Trump, um, but maybe you could also offer some speculative uh, comments on, um, on that at the end. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Lee Claire. There were really provocative uh, questions um, that I can't address straight away, but hopefully in the talk we'll um, come back to the, some of them. Um, so I'm extremely um, excited to be here in New York and at CUNY. Um, I'm, very grad I'm very grateful to CUNY uh, for hosting this event. I'm gra grateful to the people at Zone, Megan and Michael, for co-organizing this, and to Lee Claire. Um, I'm going to read out a paper. Um, I can improvise. You can't hear me? Okay, I generally need a lot more time to prepare my improvisation, so it's going to be a written paper. Writing at the end of the 1970s, the Chicago School neoliberal Gary Becker remarked that the family in the Western world has been radically altered, some claim almost destroyed by events of the last three decades. He went on to list a familiar series of ills, from the rapid rise in divorce rates and female-headed families to the decline in birth rates and the growing labor force participation of married women, which he claimed had reduced the contact between children and their mothers and contributed to the conflict between the sexes in employment as well as marriage. Becker believed that such dramatic changes in the structure of the family had more to do with the expansion of the welfare state in the post-war era than with feminism per se. 
which could be considered a consequence rather than an instigator of these dynamics. Like many of his contemporaries, both neoliberals and neoconservatives, Becker singled out AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, what he called the poor women's alimony, alimony as one of the primary causes of the breakdown of the family. Fifteen years later, we find Becker congratulating President Clinton on his efforts to end welfare as we know it, a piece of legislation which effectively represents the most dramatic overhaul of the American welfare system since the New Deal. Clinton's welfare reform is infamous for institutionalizing both workfare and marriage promotion in American social policy. Less well known is the fact that his Welfare Reform Act essentially federalizes a principle of poor relief that dates right back to the old poor law tradition, the principle that is of private family responsibility for the welfare of dependents. Even less well known is the fact that Ronald Reagan first initiated this project as governor of California in the 1970s when he sought to revive the state's old poor law rules for compelling family members to look after impoverished relatives. Clinton's welfare reform can be said to reflect both social conservative and neoliberal views on poverty management. As defenders of the competitive free market order, Neoliberals may not have cared much for the active promotion of marriage, responsible fatherhood programs, and faith-based services, all of which were included within Clinton's welfare reform. But they were certainly in favor of efforts to enforce kinship obligations as an alternative to the, redistribu to the redistribu sorry, redistribution of income. When welfare recipients refused to take care of themselves within the proper structure of the family, neoliberals believed that the state had every right to leverage or indeed to create these relationships by force, just as it had every right to compel the long-term unemployed to work. Unmarried mothers who sought welfare from the state should first be obliged to seek support from an absent father via child support orders before the state dispersed any funds. At different times and in different contexts, each of the key figures of American neoliberalism, Milton and Rose Friedman, Richard Posner, Gary Becker, Richard Epstein, Richard Wagner, and James Buchanan, can be found invoking the idea that the natural obligations of family should serve as a substitute for the welfare state. Indeed, that the altruism of the family represents a kind of primitive mutual insurance contract still operative in the family-based economies of Southern Europe and one we would do well to revive today. Does it make sense for these champions of contractual liberty to want to enforce the legal and economic bonds of kinship as inescapable non-contractual obligations? And should we be surprised to learn that the American neoliberals were stridently opposed to the sexual privacy jurisprudence of the 1970s, which turned sexual freedom into a constitutional right and ushered in the so-called sexual revolution in family law? Or that Gary Becker and Richard Posner were opposed to no-fault divorce? Only, I would argue, if we neglect the role of family responsibility within the neoliberal vision of a free market order and only if we forget the historical relationship between economic liberalism and the poor law tradition, a tradition which, in the words of one historian, confounds the economic and moral obligations of kinship. Yet this oversight, this oversight pervades much of the recent literature on neoliberalism, where we find either a complete absence of discussion of the place of family within free market economics, or, particularly coming from the left, the idea that neoliberalism is destructive of economic security precisely because it, pro it promotes personal freedom, in particular personal sexual freedom, over and above the solidity of the Fordist family wage. We find this argument most explicitly in the work of the German social theorist Wolfgang Streich, who laments that the Fordist family was replaced by the flexible family in much the same way as Fordist employment was replaced by flexible employment. It is implicit also in Boltanski and Chappello's new spirit of capitalism, which distinguishes, distinguishes between a good critique of capitalism, 
focusing on economic insecurity and the need for social protection, and a bad critique focusing on the sexual and gender normativities of the Fordist family wage. Most surprisingly, however, the ancient articulation of this position in the work of Nancy Fraser, who poses the rhetorical question, was it mere coincidence that second wave feminism and neoliberalism prospered in tandem, or was there some perverse subterranean affinity between them? and goes on to answer in the affirmative, claiming that our critique of the family wage now supplies a good part of the romance that invests flexible capitalism with a higher meaning and moral point. Implicit here is the idea that the leftist critique of sexual normativity was responsible for destroying the economic foundations of Fordist security and therefore paved the, paved the way for neoliberalism. Such an analysis would seem to find confirmation in Foucault's prescient observation that the American neoliberals were beyond normativity, uninterested in the categories of abnormality or deviance that were pervasive, pervasive within welfare state paternalism. There is, of course, a very real relationship between the dismantling of the Fordist social contract, the rise of second wave feminism, and the so-called revolution in family law. Feminism would not, have amounted to much, would not have amounted to much if it hadn't destroyed the family wage, a system that ensured the economic dependence of women on working men, although arguably this was as much the result of spontaneous processes of exit as overt activism. But beyond this, my argument with this literature is that it misrepresents the causal relationships between neoliberalism and the social movements of the late of the late Fordist era, and therefore ends up misrepresenting neoliberalism itself. American neoliberalism was not a backlash against the post-war welfare state as such, nor was it primarily a, re a reaction against its founding institution, the Fordist family wage. Rather, neoliberalism in its mature form must be understood as a response to and a backlash against the critique of the family wage coming from the feminist and anti-racist left. In my book, uh, Family Values, I argue that American neoliberalism as it matured in the 1970s must be understood as an attempt to revive and reinvent the poor law tradition as a wholesale alternative to the mid 20th century welfare state. This was not a project that was self-evident in the Chicago School of American Neoliberalism at its starting point in the 1930s, and indeed was far from evident as late as, 1970s, as 1970 when, Mil when Milton Friedman could be found collaborating with President Nixon on the project of a basic guaranteed income. Rather, it crystallized in the mid-1970s, a turning point in American politics when the perfect storm of inflation, unemployment, and the rising militancy of the new left convinced neoliberals they must articulate a much more potent critique of the expansion of welfare under President Johnson's Great Society. It is at this point, I argue, that American neoliberals perfected their signature critique of the welfare state, and that American neoliberals neoliberalism per se, acquired its mature form, in many ways distinct from the early Chicago school neoliberalism of the 1930s, and, um, sorry, in many ways distinct from the early Chicago school neoliberalism of the 1930s. And, is it, and it is at this point that someone like Milton Friedman completely abandoned any attempt to reform the welfare state in its existing form. Instead, the American neoliberals now turned back to the much older pre-New Deal poor law tradition of relief to find inspiration for their welfare reform initiatives. This is a tradition that dates right back to the Elizabethan poor laws and last flourished in the late 19th century in what is referred to as the Gilded Age of American capitalism. A guiding principle of this tradition was the notion of family responsibility. So what is family responsibility? And what is the relevance of the poor law tradition to the history of American social welfare? 
The principle of family responsibility has deep roots in the British and North American traditions of poverty management and can be traced back to the Elizabethan poor laws of 1601, where it, where it is stated that the father and grandfather and the mother and grandmother and the children of every poor, old, blind, lame and impotent impotent person or other person not able to work, being of a sufficient ability, shall at their own charges relieve and maintain every such poor person. Many of us are familiar with the long shadow history of unfree labor that haunts the official history of free market liberalism. We are less often aware that economic liberalism was equally, equally concerned with enforcing familial relations as a substitute for public relief. Like the unfree labor contract, the unfree sexual contract is a constitutive feature of the poor law tradition. The early American colonies imported the poor laws virtually word for word, and they were later incorporated into state legal systems during the early American Republic. These laws were continually, continually reinvigorated and, and embellished to adapt to what we might call periodic episodes of sexual revolution. That is, at each historical juncture where the legal obligations of family were somehow weakened or threatened by the generalization of divorce, the waning importance of marriage, or the liberation of slaves who had never, never been married, the poor laws would be reinforced to punish those who threatened to transfer the costs of their welfare onto the state. The poor laws helped the state to contain the costs of evolving sexual mores by imposing spousal and familial support as an economic obligation. If the poor were unwilling to enter into binding, binding agreements of marriage and kinship by consent, then the state was quite happy to conjure up these unions out of thin air and impose them by force. If a male servant refused to pay for the support of his presumptive bastard child, then he would be called upon to perform unpaid labor to pay off his debts to the parish or municipality. If recently freed slaves continued to live together outside of wedlock, the state would compel them to marry and threaten them with forced labor if they refused to comply. These laws remained very much in vigor right up until the mid 20th century when they came into conflict with the principles of state-managed social insurance championed by New Deal reformers. In many instances, they were never completely overridden. An interesting feature of the, of the American welfare tradition is that the laws of family obligation survived well into the 20th century and were never fully displaced by the New Deal welfare state with its two-tiered system of social insurance for the deserving poor and discretionary public assistant, assistance programs for the undeserving poor. Throughout the early 20th century, a long war was waged between progressive social reformers who wanted to upgrade all public assistance programs to the level of social insurance, and the states, who more often than not wanted to retain the poor law provisions for the undeserving poor the idle, the transient, the disabled, the immoral, and African Americans. The poor laws were intensively focused on the policing of gender and sexuality. They excluded never married or divorced women, saw African American women as more suited to hard labor than domestic life, and policed women's sexual, relationship as a condition, sexual relationships as a condition of receiving benefits. One of the great victories of the American left in the 1960s was to almost completely expunge the last vestiges of the poor law tradition from the American welfare system by attacking the continuing hold of a, of a public assistance for unwed mothers. Throughout this decade, public interest lawyers associated with the welfare rights movement brought a series of, of test cases before the federal courts to challenge the array of moral regulations that bore down on women on welfare. Their explicit aim was to bring the sexual revolution in family law to the welfare poor. So if the Supreme Court now recognized a constitutional right to sexual privacy, why would this right not be extended to women on welfare? If middle-class white women were escaping the dependence of the Fordist family, wage, um, Fordist family wage by exiting the home, demanding equal wages and freer access to divorce, 
why would these freedoms not be extended to women on welfare also? And if marriage no longer counted in determining the legal status of middle-class children, why would the children of welfare mothers still be classified as illegitimate and punished for the sins of the parents? In a series of test cases brought before the Supreme Court between the 1960s and 70s, almost every normative stricture on the welfare benefits paid to single women were overturned. This aspect of the welfare rights movement is worth pausing over because it upsets the opposition between the politics of redistribution and sexual liberation assumed by a theorist such as Nancy Fraser and challenges commonly held assumptions about the political import of sexual privacy jurisprudence. The welfare rights movement was simultaneously seeking to extend the redistributive reach of welfare and to repeal the panoply of rules regulating gender and sexuality under the New Deal. In other words, it combined a radical politics of redistribution with a critique of sexual normativity. So it was anti-normative and redistributive at the same time. Many on their left have criticized the sexual privacy jurisprudence of the 1960s, amongst other reasons because it implicitly confines sexual freedom to the private sphere. Although I am sympathetic with these critiques, at times I think they work with an overly literal reading of the language of jurisprudence. In the case of the welfare rights movement, it was a question of extending the so-called principle of sexual privacy to the most public of domains, public assistance, and to those welfare clients whose sexual behavior was habitually subject to unrelenting public scrutiny. It was a question of undermining the family wage from the bottom up, from the bottom up bottom up by demanding a social wage for all women, free from moral regulation and independent of their relationship to a man. This particular critique of welfare and this particular challenge to the Fordis family wage system was profoundly un unsettling to people from right across the political spectrum. And it is this specific challenge, I argue in my book, that crystallized the enormous welfare backlash of the 1970s. It is in this period that you begin to hear the argument that public spending on welfare was making women too independent of presumptive husbands and fathers, and thus effectively subsidizing the breakdown of the family. And it is at this moment that neoliberals and neoconservatives begin to understand inflation as a moral crisis that threatened to destabilize both the free market order and the family. Neoliberals and neoconservatives who had hitherto tolerated or openly embraced the New Deal welfare state turned viciously against it when it brought sexual liberation to women on welfare. The welfare state as such could no longer be tolerated when it was no longer founded on the normative premises of the male breadwinner family. Again, the point bears repeating. The neoliberal critique of welfare as we recognize it today did not develop of its own accord, but was fashioned in response to the much more ambitious critique coming from the, from the feminist, particularly black feminist left. Both neoliberals and neoconservatives understood this critique as symptomatic of a larger crisis of inflated desire and excessive demand, indeed as the primary cause of the inflation of the 1970s. What they proposed in response to this perceived crisis was not a return to the Fordist family wage. This particular nostalgia would be the hallmark of the left, but rather the strategic reinvention of the poor law tradition of private family responsibility. So it's as if they jumped back in response to the critique of the family wage uh, coming from the left, they too uh, decided to abandon the family wage, but by jumping back to this much older tradition. At times this meant that the federal government expressly sought to revive and federalize state poor laws of family responsibility. As early as the 1970s, Ronald Reagan, who was governor of California at the time, passed a Welfare Reform Act that revived the state poor laws, obliging family members of the poor to pay for the costs of their confinement in state institutions and compelling single mothers on welfare to identify and seek support from an absent father rather than the state. <clears throat> 
This project later formed the blueprint for President Clinton Clinton's monumental welfare reform of 1996, which effectively federalized the principle of private paternal responsibility for the welfare of mothers and children. More often, the project was achieved by default, as cuts to public funding in healthcare, education, and welfare pushed more and more people back toward kinship-based forms of self-care and mutual support, and as the expansion of consumer credit turned household deficit spending into a substitute for state deficit spending. The highly gendered nature of this shift from public to private, read familial welfare, has been amply critiqued by feminists. It is over, overwhelmingly women, mothers, daughters, and grandmothers who have picked up the tab when it comes to the care of dependents. Men, especially minority men, have more often been targeted as absent breadwinners through the generalization of child support orders in lieu of direct welfare benefits. In this paper, I want to focus on a lesser known aspect of this story the neoliberal response to the AIDS crisis of the early 1980s, because it illustrates very nicely the nuance of the neoliberal take on sexual freedom and normativity. At the time, both Chicago and Virginia School neoliberals were very much involved in debates around the reform of social insurance and the role that should be ascribed to individual risk-taking in the regulation of both private and public health insurance systems. Infamously, the Virginia School neoliberal, Mark Pauley, popularized the idea of moral hazard as early as 1968, and this argument was key to the neoliberal assault on social insurance in general, and no-fault health insurance in particular. In 1993, the Chicago School law and economics scholar, Richard Posner, and a student of Gary Becker's, Thomas Philipson, published a book called Private Choices and Public Health. The AIDS epidemic was a perfect case study for these theorists because it represented, in their words, an ostensibly public health crisis that wasn't, in fact, public in nature because it was largely occasioned by voluntary acts of consensual sex, sex between adults. It therefore represented for them the perfect illustration of the limiting conditions of social insurance. The state should not be expected to take any action, either in the form of health, insur health insurance or the funding of safe sex, safer sex education, because the risks were in most cases known to the individual in advance, confined to the individual and voluntarily assumed. But neither then could the state be justified in undertaking any of the paternalist measures were, which were at the time being advocated by Reagan's social conservative advisers. Posner and Philipson were opposed to the crim criminalization of sodomy and prostitution, the closure of bathhouses, or the use of quarantine, all normative disciplines of sexuality that had been widely de deployed throughout the 20th century as means of regulating public health. In this respect, Posner and Philipson are consistent with the utilitarian philosophy of pleasure maximization set out in Posner's Sex and Reason, and elsewhere expounded by Gary Becker. This is a philosophy that dispenses with a priori judgments about the normative or non-normative nature of pleasure-seeking activities, and evaluates such, act such activities only in terms of their individual and social costs. All areas of human activity can be conceived of as market equivalents, a literal trade in pleasure and pain, replete with real prices or failing that, quasi-prices or risk factors. We may want to intervene in these quasi-markets by increasing the price of certain activities, that is, by tweaking incentives. But neoliberals are a priori hostile to the outright paternalism of, say, drug prohibition or anti-sodomy laws. Incentives such as prices or price equivalents such as monetary sanctions or fines are okay, since someone who really wants to maximize their pleasure will always calculate that the risks of incurring a fine are lower than the benefits of having fun and act accordingly. But prohibition based on normative principles is something they are unwilling to countenance. Yet the neoliberals do also envisage a number of limit cases where some kind of government intervention becomes justifiable. 
This is the case when the private sexual acts of consenting adults give rise to social externalities that must be taken in charge by the state and taxpayers. For example, when women give birth to children out of wedlock or expect the state to look after them after divorce, or when people without private insurance engage in irresponsible actions such as unprotected, unprotected sex that might lead to costly STDs. At this point, neoliberals are willing to countenance the intervention of the state to enforce the personal and, and beyond this, the marital and familial responsibility of the risk taker in question. The anti, sorry, the anti normativity of the Chicago school neoliberals is therefore highly conditional and premised on the assumption that you must fully internalize, that is, bear the costs of your own private actions. This nuance helps, helps explain why neoliberals were consistently opposed to no-fault divorce because it created too many dependent women and children and were very hostile to the sexual privacy jurisprudence of the 1970s because it seemed to introduce a right to sexual freedom that the state would then be expected to subsidize. For example, when women went on welfare or gay men engaged in promiscuous, unprotected sex. Importantly, neoliberals are not only calling for the individual assumption of risk in the form, say, of private insurance, but also the marital and familial assumption of risk, particularly when it comes to the social costs of sexual freedom. So when it comes to the question of gay male promiscuity, Posner and Philipson argue that the state should intervene, but only to recognize same-sex marriage, which they see as the best way of internalizing the health costs of HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. So Posner and Philipson were in fact some of the earliest supporters of same-sex marriage, and their argument in favor of this institution derives entirely from the poor law principle of family responsibility. The idea, that is, that economic and moral obligation within the marital couple should take the place of social welfare. In an earlier text, Posner refers to what he calls as the insurance function of marriage, pointing to the fact that marriage is expected to serve as a form of risk protection in those social contexts where, in his words, kinship has receded, but the market and social insurance is not yet common. Or, we might add, has significantly diminished. This insurance function of marriage, he writes, arises from the fact that the correlation of spouses' health and other welfare factors is less than one. So given a mutual obligation of support and assistance, marriage serves as a form of health, hunger, and life insurance. Ultimately then, Posner and Philipson identify the legal institution of marriage as a substitute for social insurance and the most efficient means of minimizing the social costs of healthcare. Non-normative lifestyles are acceptable as long as they are premised on an alternative moral philosophy of private family obligation and mutual marital support. This double allegiance finds expression in the idea that non-normative sexual relationships must ultimately be channeled into the legal form of marriage to become acceptable. This argument was outlined in a context where self-care or home-based care was being loudly touted as a solution to the inflating costs of the public health uh, hospital system. And at a moment when Reagan, interestingly, reintroduced so-called filial obligation laws, making it legal for states to recoup the costs of hospital-based care from adult children. The idea that legalized marriage would help same-sex same couples care for themselves and thus relieve the state of the, burden of, care, of the burden of caring for them has been one of the most successful arguments in favor of legal reform and is pervasive in the American jurisprudence. Here we encounter an aspect of neoliberalism that, that eludes the terms of Foucault's now classic analysis. Neoliberals may well be in favor of the decriminalization of drugs, sodomy, bathhouses, and prostitution, and are adamantly opposed to the kind of normative police powers that regulated or outlawed such practices under the mid-20th century welfare state. And yet the neoliberal critique of normativity ends up endorsing an alternative form of moral philosophy, 
In his Sex and Reason, Posner himself is at pains to make clear that libertarian is not the same thing as libertine or free love. Interestingly enough, referring to Foucault's late work on the use of pleasure as the perfect example of such a non-normative yet non-libertarian ethics. Posner's sexual ethics combine, combines radical anti-normativity with an equally radical commitment to the welfare role of the marital unit and the private family. And in some ways, I think, this captures the strange double movement of contemporary queer politics, which is always pushing at the frontiers of the normative, while just as insistently reinscribing these non-normative ways of life into legally recognized forms of partnership and reproduction into new forms of legitimacy, in fact, since this process has also entailed a revival of old laws around the legitimacy of children. Once you recognize that American neoliberalism proposes a revival and reinvention of the poor law principle of family responsibility, you begin to understand how neoliberals have been able to forge a working relationship with social conservatives over the past four decades a relationship that otherwise appears enigmatic. Neoliberals and social conservatives are equally invested in the promotion and enforcement of legal family obligation, albeit for different reasons. Neoliberals because they oppose the state subsidization of irresponsible lifestyle choices. Neoconservatives because they see the bonds of family life as foundational to social order itself. In fact, this convergence of interests, uh, sorry, this convergence of interests is nothing new. A similar alliance between, alliance between classical liberals and social conservatives defined the so-called gilded, gilded age of late 19th century capitalism also, an era of triumphant laissez-faire economics in which public relief was marginalized in favor of charitable systems of poverty management focused on family responsibility. In some sense, then, the, con the contemporary alliance between neoliberalism and social conservatism recalls this earlier period of American political economic life. What is nevertheless distinct about the contemporary era is the extent to which the imperative of family responsibility is now mediated by consumer credit markets, debt contracts, and housing wealth. In the past three decades, we have seen both a frightening resurgence of inherited wealth as a, brute, as a brute determinant of class, and a counteracting move to soften the blow by extending credit to Fordism's marginal and non-normative subjects. Here again, we seem to be dealing with a paradoxical experience of widening social access, what we might call debt-leveraged anti-normativity, combined with the resurgent import of the family and its private channels of wealth transmission. The non-normative lifestyle becomes accessible as if on credit, and as long as it is legitimated in the form of the private family. But this is the subject of another talk. Thank you. All right, yeah. Do, yeah, do you want to start out with a couple of questions and then we can open it up to the audience? Maybe about inflation and my generous reading of Fordism. <laughs> I mean, so, so the New Deal welfare state was extraordinarily uh, restrictive. Um, uh, so, you know, Keynesianism, as it was embodied uh, politically and socially, you know, gave rise to an enormously, enormously restrictive uh, uh, welfare state uh, organized precisely around uh, sexual and gender and racial normativity. Um, uh, 
You know, but something interesting happened in the 60s and uh, 70s uh, where these movements took the premise of redistribution and said, uh, you need to include us, the non-normative uh, subjects, and we'll critique sexual normativity while we're at it. And, um, you know, this, this expansion of the welfare state beyond the limits of the original Keynesian consensus, I think was perceived rightly by the neoliberals and neoconservatives as um, a breaching of the contract, a, a breaching of the Keynesian contract. And I think inflation, inflation was the real economic expression of that. I mean, in some sense, I think they were right to see uh, inflation as an inflation of demands uh, from the left. I don't think it was as dangerous or the crisis that they made it out to be because after all, this was the period where inequality in the United States reached its lowest levels uh, ever. <laughs> and we've since reversed uh, from then. And this had everything to do with the fact that uh, the, the labor unions were, were powerful enough, so powerful that they were able to uh, keep ratcheting up their, their wage demands in uh, response to uh, price inflation um, so that, you know, in essence, they, they lost nothing from it. And that even welfare benefits at the time, many welfare benefits were indexed to in inflation. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary kind of feature of this uh, period. And that has everything to do with the, you know, great increase in equality that we see in that, in that period. Um, um, the fact that, uh, I mean, let's go, uh, you know, some, someone foresaw this, uh, the economist Koleski foresaw that, you know, the kind of, uh, there was a kind of self-destruct mechanism embodied within Keynesianism because it would so, he thought it as so enabling the working class that of course they would inflate their demands. But this was, this enabled more than the white working class. This enabled uh, those who had been completely excluded from the Fordist contract to demand uh, uh, a social wage. And the kind of uh, flick, flick point was when the most excluded and the most stigmatized, um, the most abject, of uh, subjects, women on welfare, um, demanded that not only they should be included and that their benefits should be kind of indexed, but also that they should be free of any kind of normative regulation of their sexuality. And, you know, this in some ways quite rightly was seen as an utter kind of breach of the contract that even people on the right had accepted, even people like Milton Friedman had accepted until then. They were like, uh-uh, this is not working for us anymore. Inflation is a crisis. We need to um, uh, counter this and reverse this situation. So, you know, in some ways, it's a, you might see that as a, a generous reading of Fordism, but you could see these, these movements as destroying Fordism. I mean, they certainly destroyed, in some sense, Nancy Fraser is, is right. Feminism, the welfare rights movement, destroyed the family wage. This is what they set out to do. They weren't destroying redistribution. This is where I think there's a the, the key nuance that she misses. They were demanding more redistribution. And I think somehow there's a strange uh, compression of history whereby these movements are read as ne proto neoliberal. They were asking for more redistribution minus the normativity, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just like one, I guess one follow up question. What it, by the, you know, by the mid to late 1960s, when in, in the book, that's when you really present um, the, you know, various anti-normative or various minoritarian social movements um, at the height of their social power, right? Um, reaping the benefits of inflation before it has yet become a crisis mm -hmm. in the language you just used. So then I guess what I'm wondering is, um, is that is that kind of moment of broad-based social organization and agitation that you uh, bring together in this book, is that dependent on the wage form? Is that dependent on an expanding wage form? In which case, what does that mean for similar social movements without an expanding wage form today? 
right? What's a, what's a credit-based right. social agitation? Right. Yeah, so I, I do have an argument uh, with there's a certain kind of line um, which is quite uh, popular now that, um, you know, somehow the rise of um, asset inflation and uh, credit democratization means that we need, uh, the wage relation is somehow um, uh, obsolete, the credit relation has kind of uh, subsumed uh, that and we need to work only in the arena of credit, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to work in the arena of credit and uh, say, you know, mortgage debt and student debt, you know, the obvious thing, you know, credit is okay as long as you don't have to pay it back. <laughs> you know, it's a lovely thing as long as you don't have to uh, pay it back. You know, but there's, there's a, a word for credit that you don't pay back, it's a wage. So, I mean, of course, strategically, we have to begin with uh, different problems, uh, you know, different uh, uh, entry points at the moment. But this whole idea that the wage relation is no longer important, I think, is ridiculous. The fact that wages are, are, are stagnating, um, stagnating to a point that the Federal Reserve can't get inflation up if it wanted to and is like worried about disinflation. In, in Europe, it's worried about deflation. Um, you know, that tells you that the wage relation means something. Neoliberalism has almost been too successful. So I think, you know, to any kind of labour politics that we'd be pushing up uh, the wage right now would be extremely um, important because it would dent the impact of, um, of asset inflation. It would be the only thing that could blunt or reverse asset inflation. So I think, you know, wage inflation is absolutely a strategy. Um, but you know another way of another way of denting asset inflation is um, strategic debt defaults um, and um, not paying back debts, finding ways of uh, cancelling debt. You know, so there's different ways into this. But I don't see. I mean, I think you have to think of the credit relation, the wage relation, symbiotically. This idea that one surpasses the other to me that makes no sense whatsoever. So I, I don't know if that answers your question about. Do you mean a return to commodification? Did you mean that is wages? Yeah. I right. Mean, yeah, okay. The commodification of labor. Okay. Like this is what the commodification of labor makes possible. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, but in a sense, wage inflation means that labor is becoming immeasurable. So commodification isn't quite the word. But anyway, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> I won't geek out. <laughs> And then if you could just speak clearly into the mic, um, that would be great as we're going along. Hi. Um, um, I hope this doesn't take us too far afield, but I, I have a, a question about uh, the, the use of the term neoliberalism and, and, and wondering if you are familiar with a critique that Jeffrey Goldfarb recently wrote in um, public seminar at, at the new school that was sort of questioning the whether the use of the term um, might be helpfully substituted by uh, talking about market fundamentalism um, in 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 um, part of, part of the reason is that there may be a tendency to conflate neoliberalism with liberalism in in political contexts and um and um so one is that a helpful distinction and then two uh where does liberalism fi figure into this larger landscape of of um polit political and economic ideas it is it essentially equated with oh uh, yeah, where where does liberalism, properly speaking, fit into this? Is it essentially equated with the welfare state um, or, or ideas around the welfare state? The American meaning of liberalism? No, I think classical economic liberalism. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, know, I know it's a good uh, question. I mean, I think uh, what do you call the Virginia or Chicago school other than neoliberals? Like, I think it's a good term. But it's true that, you know, 
uh, America is the one place where it is, it, the word does lend itself to kind of um, unfortunate confusions. And I think um, uh, it, is unf it's, it, it is meaningful in a sense that there is a slippage, particularly in left literature critiquing neoliberalism, um, a slippage between the idea of uh, kind of sexual liberalism and neoliberalism. Um, so I can see why you'd want another term. It's just that um, so much consensus has been reached now that I think it's not a good idea. You know, it's like Keynesianism. Like it's not it's not perfect. Keynes, Keynes didn't have much to say about the welfare state, but we talk about you know Keynesian welfare state capitalism. Market fundamentalism I think is problematic because of the word fundamentalism. Um, to me, that means something very particular. Um, they're, they're not invested in fundamental value in any sense. Um, I think it confuses the issue. So the, the question about liberalism, you meant classical economic liberalism? I guess the, 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 the question is, is your, your, your critique was focusing on com comparing uh, neoliberalism and neoconservatism and their influence on, on policy through this period of time. Where does, where, do, where does liberalism or left policy making fit into this, the, this, this picture? And, and oh, did, soft did, left, soft did, left. Did, We've been having this conversation. Didn't it have an influence listening. and you know, per, maybe with the implication that this has some implication for where left and liberal politics should lead us today? Yeah, well, you know, uh, the, the kind of welfare rights movement I see is kind of ranging from liberalism. I call it soft left, but we have been having an argument about whether that means anything. Um, but it ranged from kind of soft left, progressive left to kind of, I, th I think, kind of far left critiques of, of welfare. Um, uh, so, you know, that was definitely part of the, the, the spectrum of late forward social movements. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Are you are you saying that in in her today? What do you mean today? No, in the in the book, where did left policy fit in historically? So your right. your your book, you're outlining neoliberal and new right, conservative. Right. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, what I'm doing is like, um, if you look at uh, the progressive. Uh, social reformers of the New Deal. They were very critical of the family responsibility tradition, but uh, their challenge to the family responsibility tradition was that it destroyed the family. <laughs> so everyone was arguing uh, in the name of the family. And even when you get to the welfare rights movement, and you look at people who were very radical within that movement, you know, uh, Piven and Cloud had a very radical strategic notion of pushing rights to their limit so that they kind of jammed the system it was not a, sometimes i think there's a funny kind of historical critique of that rights-based uh, uh, language that misunderstands that they were completely using this in a kind of um, performative um, absurdist theatrical way and that they, they were completely critical of the limits of rights-based language. And yet people like Piven and uh, Cloward, they were horrified by the elements of the welfare rights movement that want, wanted minority women to, to access a social wage independently of a man. They thought that there had been a kind of, um, you know, like Moynihan, a kind of, uh, uh, that this was um, a threat to masculinity and that the point was precisely to um, reform families through a social wage. So that the element of critique that I'm looking at and uh, that I think triggered this enormous kind of like, um, you know, visceral backlash of the 1970s was marginal even within the left. You know, it was really at the intersection of kind of liberationist, um, uh, um, feminist and anti-racist critique. These vo voices were marginal, and yet a lot of the public interest litigation was precisely going in that direction. So it was a real threat, if you wanted to see it that way. Hi. Ooh. 
Thanks for your thanks for your words and, and your book. Um, I was wondering, and I don't know if this maybe gets touches a little bit on what the gentleman just asked, but um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the tradition or the in in intellectual history that looks back to some of the periods that we associate with the development of American capitalism, and instead of highlighting what is you know quote unquote properly liberal highlights the influence of classical or civic republicanism, yeah. um, which I, I maybe gets touches on the question of, you know, which, mm. you know, when, and because I, I do not think you're guilty of this at all, but I have seen uses of the term neoliberalism and I think, well, wait, are we talking John Locke? Are we talking Ricardo? Like who, like which liberalism are we talking about? Mm. Um, and it, and it, to me, it, it touches on this debate that seems to have been happening I'm still learning about it. it seems to have been happening for for quite a long time of you know what is it that we call this thing that seems to reign yeah. in American history yeah yeah so I mean the way I read I mean I call it classical economic liberalism but um, I'm not reading it textually so I you know the way I read neoliberalism is through the Paul or the way I read economic classical liberalism is through the Paul or tradition which the textual tradition of liberalism would disavow in some sense, in the same way that neoliberals never, they have such, uh, s s so little a sense of their historical embeddedness that they would never say, we support the Paul Law tradition, and yet they're completely kind of translating the language of that. So, you know, the Paul Law tradition was never, you, you immediately see the flip side to um, the idea of market freedom, um, the free labor contract, um, and so the kind of uh, um, the interventionist, the heavily intervention, in, interventionist police si policing side of li liberalism becomes immediately clear. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, a lot of connections are going off in my head. Um, so I guess I wanted to return to Lee's question about immigration. Um, and so I was interested in thinking about the question of normativity as it relates to race and ethnicity. So the Gilded Age charity programs that you spoke of were for me not just about family responsibility, but about training European immigrants into norms of um, white respectability. Um, so likewise, if we redefine neoliberalism through that rubric um, that you propose, I think we find that the ideal neoliberal subject is not really the entrepreneur, but the immigrant, right, possibly an undocumented immigrant who does not ask the state for uh, welfare. And um, I'm thinking of sort of the immigrant family business model where you know family members work for free. Yeah. Um, and then the hope for the future is then displaced onto like public education for the next generation. Um, and that's, so that kind of tracks with the 1965 Immigration Act, which privileged family reunification. Um, so I guess this is not so much a question, just an invitation to talk more about the immigrant as a, nom a normative or non-normative um, category within neoliberalism, and you know, even to venture in, in, in this way is the Asian American model minority kind of the epitome of this um, system. Yeah, um, so I haven't written directly about this, but um, yeah, I was having a conversation with um, a, a student of mine who was writing, who's writing about uh, immigration law who had in, Australia and how there's all these kind of family responsibility uh, principles that come even at, at, at the level of the visa application. So you have to be able to prove that you have sufficient assets to care for your family, to send your uh, children to uh, school, etc. So you have to prove complete non-dependency for many years into the future before you're able to um, come. And one way that in, in practice people have um, been able to uh, perform this even my mum's um, uh, uh, family, and I, th I think of this when I, um, because people like Becker are always kind of romanticizing Southern American, uh, sorry, Southern European uh, familial economies and familial enterprise. And um, I think uh, uh, many uh, migrants, uh, you know, Asian and Southern Europeans, uh, the way they did survive uh, they managed to survive immigration was to um, uh, mobilize what they later came to see as, as traditional, but in fact, I think it was reinvented, 
uh, forms of um, kinship-based solidarity and wealth sharing and even labor so that the family itself became a kind of household production uh, unit. So yeah, definitely, I think there's a thread there. I know there's two extra chapters to this book that weren't written. <laughs> I would just add to, I think your question is a really, is a really good one. And I, I think it's, um, I think the final, the final story is, it's not only that the, particularly the undocumented, undocumented immigrant uh, doesn't ask for anything, um, but then, and this is what fits so well, I think, with, your, with the narratives of your book, doesn't ask, but nonetheless becomes the subject of the moral panic. This is the one who's taking, mm -hmm. right? Now it's not simply, you know, uh, the, the single mother or the welfare queen. It's the undocumented immigrant who is now causing precisely the kind of problems that you, that you outline in the book. So I think it's a great point. And also, to an extent, I think it kind of enables these... Uh, transnational kind of informal welfare networks, so where people will be sending back money to, uh, you know, people who are poorer or are supposed to be poorer in the home country, yeah. and then compensating for the, wealth, the kind of insufficiencies of welfare there. Mm. Hi. Well, again, thank you for the lecture. This was really interesting. And um, my question is, continuing on the topic of immigration and uh, in particular I'm interested um, in the concept of brain drain and that the relationship of um, I guess pulling the individuals from other countries who have you know initially had some resources or maybe have had uh, the welfare state of their country invest in them um, towards the United States and how if you, and maybe you could touch upon the, I guess, exchange, the cultural exchange and the export of neoliberalism onto the countries that serve as the, um, I guess, um, providers of uh, such individuals. Yeah, well that, I mean, for some reason I'm thinking of the Australian case now more than the American, but um, so in, in Australia it's really, easy to read the neoliberal influence because people, policymakers were so proud to be importing American ideas that they always tell you when they're doing it. So, um, so the, the, the two kind of programs or de, um, Commonwealth departments that imported neoliberal ideas were education and migration. So under the kind of umbrella of human capital theory. So, uh, so when migration laws changed in the late uh, 80s, I think, toward kind of uh, skill-based uh, migration, this was all under the aegis of human capital theory, the idea that you would bring in skilled workers who would be able to sustain themselves and their families independently, and you will, as a state, you will not have had to provide for their whole kind of welfare and education um, through earlier years. Yeah, thank you so much for this talk, which is very thought-provoking. Um, I have maybe a little bit of a more philosophical question, and it, um, I'm, I'm wondering about um, the relationships between individualism, collectivity, um, different forms of sociality that uh, run through these different um, phases and uh, faces of the welfare um, state. So in the welfare state, you could say that uh, it's the individual in a relationship to the state. Uh, Neoliberalism interferes and tries to privatize this. And then you say, but it also uh, veers back into this family kinship model um, in order to abolish or uh, wreck the welfare state. Um, and then you bring up um, queer politics, which introduces into this family model a more, if you will, progressive um, kind of kinship uh, model. Um, I'm wondering the critique um, that um, your analysis seems to imply um, of that, let's say, queer expanded family kinship model for the welfare state. 
uh, whether that critique of yours doesn't imply an even higher individualism or you know what what kind of uh, kinship model uh, what kind of um, association uh, model um, in your view would be progressive would be an alternative to the neoliberal queer um, 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 base of the current um, welfare or non-welfare state? Mm. I guess um, um, I'm a bit skeptical about ideas of alternative kinship um, because I think kinship is uh, kinship and I think um, of course some are defined as more or less uh, normative but all have this kind of incipient economic uh, value and can be leveraged in that way and will be. Um, so this idea that alternative kinships, I, I don't understand the fascination for that idea or the idea that it, there's somehow resistance there because it's alternative. Um, in terms of like, uh, you know, individualism to me d describes neither the neoliberal welfare state or the, the Keynesian welfare state. Both are, both are uh, uh, focused on the family. The difference is that uh, the, family, the Fortis family wage is about redistributing income, the state redistributing income through the family, so through a particular normative structure of the family. The neoliberal welfare state uh, is about the family becoming a substitute for welfare, so leveraging the family and forcing fa private family obligations. Um, I mean, there's, there's paradox there because it's the state enforcing private family obligations as a substitute for welfare. Um, and in a sense, I think there's more room for um, alternative, so-called alternative kinships at this point in time. And I think, again, I don't know why I keep on thinking about Australian case studies now instead of American, but say um, uh, Centrelink, which, which is the Australian Unemployment Office, was the first government department uh, in Australia to want to uh, legally recognize same-sex relationships because when you're in a kind of a spousal unit you get less uh, less benefits because there's an assumption of mutual support um, so I think this kind of um, um, you know neoliberal welfare state uh, is anti-normative uh, in uh, to an extent that the Fortis welfare state wasn't except at this crisis moment in the in the 70s, but is uh, um, this goes along with the idea that the uh, spousal couple or the, the family or even the extended family actually in Australia is primarily responsible uh, for welfare. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my question is about the feminist movement at that time. If you see that as also playing a role in terms of uh, um, the neoliberal thinking at that time in the 60s and the 70s. Is uh, also, sorry? Is it feminist? The feminist movement in the US. In or, neoliberal thinking. Well, and the, just to, to finish, um, because in a way uh, it implies that uh, there is a emphasis on subjectivity and choice, right? When most women in the world don't have a choice, they have to work, right? And women of color and uh, uh, so the choice for them probably would be to be able to stay home and take care of their kids instead of being subjected to a horrible working conditions or being nannies in other people's homes. So do you think that uh, the feminist movement also contributed in some ways to uh, neoliberal thinking at that time? Well, this is the kind of argument that I'm trying to counter, although I do recognize that there's you know, forms of feminism that are completely colored by neoliberalism. But I think there's been a conflation in that, you know, when I read a lot of the literature, there's an assumption that, say, sexual privacy jurisprudence, which was you know, also about freedom of choice, was neoliberal. They hated sexual privacy jurisprudence. So there's a nuance that gets, um, that gets um, effaced in that reading, I think. Um, and the idea, I think there's, 
you know, there's a push in certain kind of feminist literature which is to say that middle class white women are all about uh, freedom and sexual liberation and birth control. Uh, the oppressed women of the world are all about, you know, uh, reproduction and wanting to be mothers. And I, I just resist that because I think if you look at the welfare rights movement, which was, you know, the poorest of the poor, minority women, they're also uh, 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 pushing for a critique of, of sexual normativity and asking for a kind of a liberation from their role as only kind of uh, defined in relation to their children or, or, or partners. And I think... Um, I, I think that kind of argument that um, uh, free, freedom belongs to the middle class and the bourgeois, I, I, I resist that. <laughs> Labor is liber Labor is liberating when you're already a domestic worker, yeah. I mean, that there, there's some really interesting kind of um, uh, uh, testimony who are like, like saying, you know, saying, yeah, we're in this double bind because we don't, uh, we want to be, uh, uh, we want a social wage, you know, we don't want to be forced into to domestic labour in lieu of welfare because, you know, white women have always uh, had that. But, and so there was an element of the movement, movement that was also very maternalist, but there was also an element that said, we don't want to be... Uh, um, confined within this kind of uh, double bind, either mothers or domestic workers for white households. We at the business hand up right here for quite at least two. Yeah. Which two? Put your hands yeah, right high. Yeah, okay, right. okay. All right, one and then two. Or two and or, then one. Okay. <laughs> thank, you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to read the book. And um, there's, there's a tension or contradiction between the welfare state as paternalistic, as this, you know, sort of dehumanizing bureaucracy. The welfare rights movement spends so much time in this intimate struggle with this bureaucracy. And, you know, you still have this um, disciplinary mode. And then on the other hand, you have the sort of neoliberal thread of Wendy Brown's language around responsabilization and sort of the making of the self-sufficient self. And the, it seems there's, there's a tension or contradiction there. And I'm wondering how through your work you read that or you, you find it best to frame or think about that conflict or um, sort of opposition between the two. Yeah, well, at, at a certain point, um, neoliberals need uh, neoconservatives or new paternalists because at a certain point they recognize that there are subjects who don't deserve you know, freedom of contract, who don't deserve uh, free labor, you know, who need to be enforced into work. And you know, they never go into the details about how this should be done, but they recognize it needs to be done. You have to look to like the new paternalist, like Lawrence Mead, who you know, has volumes about exactly how you're gonna do that. So it's there that you get the whole bureaucratic answer. And, you know, there is a sense in which neoliberals and liberals and, you know, classical liberals in general have always kind of kept their hands clean and kind of delegated the problem at a certain point. They get to the limit case where they say, okay, the state needs to enforce work or needs to enforce the se sexual contract. They never actually go into, de into the detail about how. In, in a sense, they don't have the, the governmentality of enforcement. So they really have to delegate I kind of think of them as outsourcing the hard work to the social conservatives and the new paternalists and, you know, who will invent these horrible sadistic workfare programs and this kind of thing <laughs> and love every minute of it. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was very curious about um, the way I could think of your argument um, if I think about areas in which structural adjustments were enforced. Um, I'm from Senegal, and um, when I think of the welfare state, it was so inexistent. We only had it for 20 years before the structural adjustment came. And self-care was always on the family, and it was never different. And when the structural adjustment came, it was just stronger. Then indeed women had, let's say, access to labor and were kind of forced to leave home and do more than just um, what they were doing before. 
Um, but I just wonder how your argument would apply in terms of changing the family structure, but also putting more pressure on the family, which was already there. Um, yeah, I I find it um, really interesting that uh, my mom, who, who like her family came from the uh, Greek islands, I feel that she understands uh, the neoliberal uh, logic of inherited wealth and uh, familial debt and familial dependence in a way that I had to learn, having come out of um, what was a quite abundant welfare state in the 1980s in Australia. <laughs> And so it was almost like everything that we wrote off as her being kind of stuck in the past suddenly became really uh, relevant. So I think there are strange temporalities of uh, revival and people, um, depending on their experience of welfare, will have very different uh, uh, senses of how new or how old this is and, and will be more or less comfortable and kind of adept at working the system in a way. Um, this is very fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take issue with, uh, your use of the term, uh, neoliberal, uh, but I'm gonna take issue with another word you use, which is the poor law, uh, principle. Uh, because of course that has meant many, poor laws themselves have changed a lot over time. And, and in, in a certain sense, a lot of what you've said here today, uh, is not new. It, in a sense, this, this has been something that's happened before in the earlier parts in history where the poor laws were reformed and then there was an elastic movement again, and then they reacted, there was a reaction. So in a sense, you could be making the same talk in 1817 or 1717, we're making just a few adjustments here and there, but you'd, you'd be catching the same, I think, uh, the same um, uh, impulses uh, uh, in, in a lot of things. What I want to uh, ask you about, or maybe, maybe ask you to emphasize more, is, is in between the, the sort of neoliberal angle, which is more or less looking at welfare as a sort of de destroying incentives of some kind, and sort of this traditional outlook. There's also this tax revolt element in between. And this has always been sort of the big tool, is that, okay, maybe it's not a bad thing, but it's just enormous and we're gonna be bankrupt and the whole budget, so we have to do this. Mm. And, and it's always sort of been the tool in every reaction. Mm. That's always been uh, more the panic, is, is not always necessarily the destruction of the family, but, most, but you know, even if it's, even if it's traditional, it's, we're gonna go broke. Yeah. And that's a simply easy way to tap to a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, the tax revolt was the enabling moment. Like, I think if you try to understand, um, you know, you know it, it, Reagan and Thatcher were not only a kind of imposition from on high. You know, Volcker, to be able to do what he did, um, you know, after, 10 years of the Federal Reserve accommodating inflation, why was he suddenly enabled to, um, you know, kind of blitzkrieg inflation? And, you know, in the meantime, there'd been uh, the taxpayer uh, revolt. And, you know, that was a, a popular movement, a populist movement. And it was about the white working class um, splitting off psychologically from what it saw as the kind of unproductive welfare class who were living unfairly off their taxes. So again and again, uh, um, the American right is able to leverage that division within the, the working class, a division which is often that between the working class and the welfare class or the prison class. They're able to leverage that to buy over one side of the, the working class. And it's interesting that the taxpayer revolt was very much about, if you, you know, you read the discourse, it was very much about we can be self-sufficient. We have already been, we have always been self-sufficient. Of course, these uh, people had not always been self-sufficient. They'd been massively kind of subsidized, their mortgages had been massively subsidized by the state, but it was an appeal to family wealth um, and the idea that kind of massive uh, tax burdens were eroding familial uh, wealth. And then that kind of, um, that kind of continued into the whole kind of death tax, estate tax kind of politics, so yeah. I mean, I, I do think there is a difference. Uh, there is the repetition of history, which I, I think uh, needs to be uh, remarked, but also there's something novel about this era that I haven't spoken about in this 
um, in this talk, and that is the whole credit expansion that goes with it, which, which somehow, in a way, softens the blow because you can still go to college, you can still access so many things as long as you go into debt. And I don't think that kind of opening was there in earlier moments where the poor law was reinforced. You might think otherwise, I don't know. Um, it's not as easy. But yeah. It's yeah. Informally. Informally, there were forms of credit, yeah. Mm. Yeah. You would always be able to eat at somebody's table. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much for your talks tonight and for all of your really excellent questions. We'll be in the room for another few minutes, so maybe you can pick up more casual conversations there. Um, I did want to mention that on the way out, you can pick up Melinda's book, and I think tonight it's discounted, so you may want to grab a copy. Um, thank you again, so put our hands together.